you thank you so much uh, from your very busy schedule and we are privileged and honored to have you today with us um, as uh, the audience know and we have an audience today from really from all over from china from taiwan from hong kong from singapore and quite a few of course also from switzerland and europe um, eric is the professor of psychiatry um, and holds a chair of psychiatry at the university of zurich and something that we were very happy to share recently is that he got the the coveted Wagner Jaurek medal. I, I hope that I'm pronouncing it uh, correctly. And this medal is actually given um, to to scientists who have uh, really sort of uh, delivered outstanding scientific achievements in psychiatry. Uh, Eric just got that medal recently. Eric is a very um, busy person, a busy professional, and we're privileged to have you with us. So without much further ado, Eric, over to you. Cool. Good evening uh, to some of you, maybe good morning to others. And uh, dear Salman, thank you very much for the kind invitation, dear ladies and gentlemen, colleagues um, all over the world. It's really a pleasure and an honor to speak uh, to you and with you about um, depression <clears throat> and about, and this is what Salman asked me to talk about because this is the topic of our research, of our kind of the main topic of our uh, research in our department of psychiatry and psychotherapy here in Zurich, radical approaches to depression treatment, hyporeality. Um, Eric, before you go further into the next slide, very quickly, just to, uh, let the colleagues know, or the participants know, if you have any questions, just put them please in the chat box. We will have about 20 minutes or so at the end to ask questions. We will be running today's session under Chatham House rules. So you're free to ask any kind of questions. You will not be, people will not be named. Uh, we will be recording this session, but only the, the presentation part. Eric, back to you. Yes, okay, thank you so much. So this is uh, the table of content uh, uh, through which I would like to go together uh, with you. Um, so I give you a, just two slides about antidepressants, the classical antidepressants as we, as we use them uh, right now. Those medications or the, uh, the antidepressant drugs that are registered and um, available for the treatment of depression um, have been basically invented or um, found um, by a Swiss psychiatrist, Roland Kuhn, in the um, 1950s. And it was an interesting discovery. So he was um, working together with um, the pharmaceutical company Daigi in uh, Basel and they were developing an antipsychosis, an anti-schizophrenia anti drug, imipramine here. And um, so he was testing uh, this uh, molecule in uh, patients in uh, a Swiss uh, psychiatric clinic. And he found out that these patients, they did not improve regarding the psychotic symptoms, but they uh, showed an improvement of their mood. And so this was kind of the beginning of the discovery of antidepressant drugs. And from after this serendipitous um, discovery by Roland Kuhn in the 50s, um, the pharmaceutical companies in the pharmaceutical industry and research developed an abundant um, number of following drugs antidepressants, they were all then registered for the treatment of depression, but in fact, they were all based on the molecular and um, pharmacodynamic uh, mechanism um, that imipramine already had. So in a way, all the available antidepressant drugs that we are basing on our pharmacotherapeutic uh, approaches to uh, depression, are in a way modifications of imipramine. They are better regarding side effects, they are safer and so forth, but they are not, that they are not more efficacious. And um, so we call this um, hypothesis of these uh, pharmacodynamic mechanisms 
which we believe are um, are important for uh, the treatment of uh, depression is the so-called monoamine hypothesis. And basically, this means that all these drugs here have an effect on serotonin and noradrenaline or norepinephrine uh, neurotransmission in the brain. If you look here at all available antidepressants on the market worldwide, and um, they have all been tested in uh, randomized controlled, placebo controlled uh, studies um, in depressed patients, and you see that we have a clear um, efficacy um, of the drug regarding the treatment of depressive symptoms compared to placebo. And studies like that are the basis for registration of a certain drug as an antidepressant, for example, um, to be um, admitted uh, to the market. But all these drugs here are based on this monoamine hypothesis of depression. Um, the efficacy of antidepressant drugs have been criticized recently quite seriously. So, in fact, also um, several uh, people um, are questioning the efficacy of antidepressants um, just in general. And they are saying or they are uh, stating, oh, psychotherapy is much more um, efficacious. Um, so, the effect size, so let's go back, the effect size of all these drugs, just in average, is about two, uh, a point, uh, um, uh, 0 0.2. It's actually not so much compared to placebo. And so if you look at the effect size of psychotherapy, you find effect sizes ranging between 0 0.5 up to 0.6. A point eight, which is three to four times, which looks like to be more uh, three to four times more efficacious than antidepressant drugs. And so one would conclude why should we use drugs when we have psychotherapy, which is much more efficacious. And in this um, quite recent review by a um, um, by a researcher, a researcher from the Netherlands, Pete Kuipers, um, they compared different studies. So if you look at all psychotherapy studies, you find an effect size between 0.5 and 0.6, which is large. But you have to realize that these psychotherapy studies, they are not comparing um, psychotherapy versus a placebo psychotherapy or a true psychotherapy versus a placebo psychotherapy. They are comparing psychotherapy versus nothing or even worse versus a waiting group. And we know from other studies that waiting group treatment um, is not the placebo, it is a nocebo. Actually, patients who come, who are um, um, uh, put into this waiting room, they worsen in their depressive state. They are not staying stable. They are not becoming better as, um, as in a placebo group. They become worse. So it's a nocebo. So if you compare only the psychotherapy efficacy versus waiting group uh, with, uh, in studies, that did not use a waiting group as a comparison group, the effect, um, the effect size uh, shrinks down to about half, to 0.4. If you look at studies that exclude also other biases like um, association with the psychotherapy um, um, method that is being used and other um, kind, um, 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 sources of interest of, or bias of the researchers. Um, and also, if you ex exclude the publication bias, the efficacy of the effect size of psychotherapy comes down to, a point, to about point. 2.3 and is in the same range as that of antidepressants. So I look, invested some time in, um, in, in making you understand why psychotherapy efficacy studies cannot 
easily or directly be compared to randomized controlled, placebo controlled trials when we um, examine the efficacy of antidepressant drugs. So, but still saying that we are still not so happy or not uh, uh, fully uh, satisfied with um, the standard traditional antidepressants, the monoamine hypothesis based um, antidepressants. And we are looking for antidepressant drugs using based on other molecular psychopharmacological psychopharmacodynamic um, mechanisms. And the most important group that have another biological, neurobiological mechanism than the classical antidepressant drugs are the so-called psychedelics. And uh, psychedelics are right now, you know, they evoke high hopes. This is a, um, a, an article that was published some years ago in Science Magazine, where they portray kind of the hopes or the expectations that um, the scientific community has um, when they um, think of psychedelics as potential uh, drugs uh, for the treatment of depression. And so in the following slides, I will go through the most important candidates and most important representatives of uh, psychedelics and uh, just show you some very brief highlights of what we know about uh, each of these uh, psychedelic drugs. And um, at the very end, I will come then to some hypothesis how they might work differently from the classical antidepressants. The most important psychedelic is ketamine. Ketamine is not the uh, serotonin or dopamine or norepinephrine uh, allergic drug. It is an MDA, an MDA, it's a glutamate subtype receptor antagonist. Ketamine in higher doses produce psychedelic or psychotic symptoms. For example, um, if, you, if you give um, a ketamine to a healthy control subject, to a student, for example, the person feels like something like disembodiment or the experience of unity or changes in felt control and cognition or they start to develop vivid imagery uh, sensations and other so-called dissociative or psychotic uh, symptoms. So the psychedelics, and that's also the, uh, um, the basis of the name of this um, um, group of drugs, um, are associated with a dissociation between cognition, um, perception, um, and emotion. Um, nevertheless, in the year 2006, there was a very important paper in the archives of Channel Psychiatry where a group of researchers from um, Yale University, they were the first to publish um, very impressive uh, clinical results where they gave ketamine intravenously versus placebo. These are the, the ketamine effects, here the placebo effects in patients with a so-called treatment resistant depression. So these are patients who are difficult to treat, who do not respond to standard uh, treatment um, so far. And what they found is that when they injected or, or, or after this short uh, infusion of ketamine, they had an immediate starting very few minutes after the infusion and a very strong psychopathological effect, antidepressant effect, peaking 24 hours after the um, initial um, short infusion and lasting um, for several days. And this is totally different from what we see when we uh, treat a patient with an SSRI or with another um, uh, classical antidepressant where we don't see anything for the first week, 10 days, two weeks, 
And if we see an effect, this, this effect they evolve very slowly and very, you know, over day, um, um, across days and uh, weeks, but certainly not across minutes. So, and this is probably this study is the, is, is the basis for this hype and this really high, high expectations that this group or this kind of new molecules um, might kind of change the game in a treating depression. Ketamine has also a strong anti-suicidal um, effect, very impressive. After a few hours, uh, peaking two days after the, uh, after the infusion, suicidality is treated very um, strongly and impressive. So ketamine is right now is on the market. You can buy that. It's registered in Switzerland, in the U A, in the uh, in the U S, and in many other European and uh, other uh, Western countries as an uh, intranasal spray uh, application uh, marketed by the company Janssen. So the other. So this is kind of, so ketamine is kind of established. So the next step is now. Uh, psilocybin. Psilocybin is a um, is a molecule that can be found in the so-called magic, magic mushrooms. Um, psilocybin is not registered yet, but psilocybin is probably the closest to become registered um, in the nearest uh, future because there are the most studies um, after ketamine. Um, using psilocybin in the treatment of treatment resistant depression. This was a seminal paper in uh, published in Lancet uh, some years ago by an English group where they applied in treatment resistant depressed patients two times psilocybin and look what happened um, regarding their psychopathology and what they found they had an immediate effect after a few hours and a few days and what was impressing and this was actually the most impressing um, finding is that this effect after these two applications of a dose the effect was actually measurable over several days weeks and months even six months after this initial application it was still measurable compared to a group of patients without um, a treatment of psilocybin, um, they had a positive effect. So the hype was, of course, increased. And the hopes were just exorbitant uh, regarding the efficacy of uh, uh, psilocybin and other uh, psychedelics. Another study in unmedicated depressed patients using psilocybin two times an application, they had also an extremely impressive and strong effect um, in depressed patients regarding the depressed, uh, depressed, de de uh, the depressive um, symptomatology. And the most recent large study that was published in the, in the, in the, the major, most important medical journal um, uh, at all in the New England Journal of Medicine was a trial of psilocybin versus an SSRI, a standard antidepressant drug in depressed patients. I won't go into details, but what can be seen here, here, these are the effects of the SSRI, s citalopram Here are the effects of psilocybin. And this is the first study that um, causes some caution regarding the efficacy of psilocybin or other psychedelics if a, an active comparison drug is used. What you can see here descriptively, psilocybin has the, be has the better effects, but this effect, so that this difference is statistically not significant. And here we start to come into a very critical field in terms of you know, is that a patient selection bias? Is there a different expectation um, bias and so forth? So, um, so this important study actually, you know, doesn't doesn't 
doubt or doesn't question uh, in general the efficacy of psychedelics, but questions a bit, questions a bit the um, kind of the magic power of this uh, type of drugs. Another important, very famous drug is LSD, lysergic acid diethylamide, uh, invented or found by Albert Hoffman, working at Hoffman La Roche at the time in the 60s uh, of the last century. And um, so there are several studies on the way in which LSD is used in uh, but the treatment for, uh, for the treatment in uh, of depressed uh, patients and typically it's associated or combined with specific psychotherapy but these studies are not really out yet there are some published studies but methodologically they have some flaws and they are difficult to interpret but the community is working on that and there are many studies on the way of um, evaluating um, the effect and the depressant effects of LSD. A very interesting drug that is also one of the main topics in our department is ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is a um, combination of two plants found in the South uh, American jungle, Brazil and other South American countries. And the two compounds of these two plants um, is so in, in, in one of these um, uh, plants, Anisteriopsis carpi, it contains a harmaline which acts in the stomach as a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. And the other plant um, contains dimethyltryptamine, a known serotonergic, but also sigmaergic and also immune modulating and a very uh, drug or, or compound with a um, uh, very uh, broad array of um, effects, uh, not only in the brain, but also in the body. And the combination of these two drugs, so the monoamine oxidase inhibitor is, is necessary that when they eat these plants, so the shaman or the, or the people living in these countries and also the, the, the shamanic um, uh, doctors, um, when they apply that, it is necessary to combine that because DMT would be degraded in the stomach and the monoamine oxidase inhibitor docks on the monoamine enzymes in, in, in uh, enzymes in the stomach and blocks them and prevents them from degrading and metabolizing dmt so the combination uh, seems uh, it's very interesting it's interesting that they found you know that these people found it out and this is the kind of the reason why this combination um, is important. Ayahuasca is all, has also been covered by the by the journal Nature, um, and also they were writing and um, discussing um, the position and the mechanisms and the value and so forth of psych psychedelic drugs in the treatment um, of depression and other diseases in uh, psychiatry. Another drug um, that has been discussed very um, strongly is ecstasy, MDMA. Um, it also um, came on the cover of The Guardian. It's very important. There are some very nice and very good and very well uh, um, executed uh, clinical studies, not in depression. There are some, but there it didn't really work, but in PTSD. Uh, uh, mainly, where they found that in PTSD patients, soldiers or other PTSD um, um, patients, uh, MDMA in combination with psychotherapy had a very strong and very good therapeutic effect compared to psychotherapy plus placebo. So MDMA has 
that there are many studies out there, um, uh, quite a strong effect on PTSD. And a very new one, which is also kind of a psychedelic, is um, laughing gas, um, nitric, um, 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 it's, it's um, N2O, so it's not nitric oxide, so it's nitrous oxide, it's called. And this um, laughing gas, so this nitrous oxide is found in this um, in these um, um, uh, little capsules that are needed, for example, to um, um, uh, uh, to produce um, um, for cooking and um, how to produce. Um, uh, I forgot the English name. Schlagram. The cream, um, cream, cream. Yes, for, yes, exactly. Kind of um, um, cream. Whipping cream. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe you, <laughs> maybe you know the the, the, the English uh, uh, whipped term. Whipped cream. Whipped cream. Whipped cream. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah, whipped cream. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Can, exactly. Uh, to produce wheat. So you can buy that in in the grocery store for ten cents or so. And um, young people are using that as drugs, so they fill it into balloons like that, and then inhale it. What they what they uh, realize is that when they inhale it, they have a for some uh, minutes or so kind of a psychotic, psychedelic uh, state. And this has been used in uh, very good and methodologically perfect, uh, perfectly executed clinical studies in patients with treatment resistant depression. And what they found, if they treat in a placebo controlled uh, design, uh, treatment resistant, de resistant depression patients with um, this uh, nitrous oxide, they have a very strong and impressive antidepressant effect. Placebo, no effect. And um, here, these two doses of nitrous oxide, a very strong clinically relevant antidepressant effect. Another potential candidate for as a, as a psychedelic um, to treat um, depression is um, sodium oxybate. So it's GHB, it's also used as a drug. It's uh, well known as a party drug. Um, because it has kind of a sexual um, um, effect and um, so it has quite strong uh, effect. So, so the drug is also be know, uh, is known to be used, for example, um, uh, in, in, in uh, discotheques where um, young women are kind of intoxicated with uh, GHB and then raped, for example. Um, so, but in Italy, GHB is also a registered drug for the treatment of uh, narcolepsy. So, and we have done some uh, interesting studies because we, we have some, uh, had some indication that um, GHB might be a candidate for the treatment of antidepressant drugs. In fact, we have also a, um, 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 a scientific project uh, financed by the Swiss National Science Foundation in which we evaluate the effects of GHB as an antidepressant candidate. And what is interesting is what we found so far is that inflammatory factors that are increased in depression are reduced by GHB. Um, we have an effect, we knew that, but we, uh, we examined that. We found um, an increase in sexual arousing with associated changes in the brain and functional um, 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 architecture um, of uh, the brain. And we found very interestingly an increase in deep sleep, slow wave sleep um, after uh, the administration of uh, GHB. And these are all effects that speak in favor that GHB can be or can have effects that are useful or that are needed for the treatment of depression.
So what are the potential mechanisms of action? There are several of those. So one of those is, for example, we know that patients with depression, they have um, reduced concentrations of brain cell of neurons and also on glia cells in different layers of the uh, cerebral cortex. So here you see a histological um, this depiction of glia cells and neurons in uh, depressed patients and patient and here in a healthy control. And one of the effects that all these um, psychedelics produce is an enhancement of neuroplasticity. Here on the left side is the situation uh, in, um, in a depressed uh, brain. And here's the situation, it's too complicated, don't go into details, but here's the situation in a psychedelic treated brain. And there are many molecular and cellular um, observations that can be made after the administration of a psychedelic that are all pointing in the same into the same direction that neuroplasticity is enhanced. Another mechanism that is seriously discussed is the change in um, the connection, the connectivity in the human brain. So where are the normal in, in, in uh, uh, under normal conditions, there are some very well defined connections between modules and between centers uh, in the brain. And this connect, we, we call this connectome. And this connectome after, and this is right, a type, typing error, but um, that this connectome is fundamentally changed in its, in its architecture by here psilocybin or other um, psychedelics. So we believe that the connection, the architecture of the, of the functional connection within the brain is changed by psychedelics. Another effect that is discussed is the so-called dissociation. I explained short briefly what dissociation is, um, is, is meaning, kind of a change of perception, emotion, cognition, and the interaction of these um, 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 operations. And psychedelics produce a dissociative effect. And there is some indication that the strength of this dissociation is somehow associated with the strength of the antidepressant effect. And on a psychological level, this weakening or this, this, this change of the connectivity might be the basis um, for, um, you know, to prepare the brain or the system for new learning experiences or for acquiring new emotional or cognitive um, mechanisms or contents that are not acquirable um, during the depressed state because these connections are so strong. So the idea behind that is that um, to bring the depressed brain in a non-depressed state, one has to reduce kind of the threshold or the level. And this level can be reduced by disrupting is pathological, pathologically too strong uh, connections uh, between different brain areas. This is another theory. This effect of this theory is being used also in our ayahuasca our treatment uh, uh, studies um, to enhance psychotherapy effects. For example, we know that ayahuasca or other psychedelics enhance empathy, binding, social, the feeling of social connectedness, perspective shifts, value shifts, and so forth. So the idea or the basic concept behind that is that the psychedelics kind of prepare the system 
um, for a better uh, preparedness or better acceptance of new learning contents. But there are also other effects, for example, expectation effects. Already the old Greeks, they knew we have a placebo effect. If you believe that something is working, it works. The chance that it works is much stronger than when we believe it does not work. So we cure most successfully in whom the people have the most confidence. And uh, in these psychedelic antidepressant studies, we see a selection bias that mainly patients um, who gone on such studies who have an interest in psychedelics or are, are believing that psychedelics might help. So we have certainly a um, placebo effect. But we have also an economy effect. This is kind of interesting. So psych um, um, psilocybin was actually just last year had his um, uh, a preparation of psilocybin had his, his had its um, um, uh, IPO. So it was brought by a company called Compass um, to the stock exchange. And there's a lot of money. There are billions of uh, dollars behind um, all this research and all these companies. And um, very successful investors like Peter Thiel or um, Christian Angermeyer from Germany, uh, large billionaire investors are also investing in psilocybin and there's certainly a commercial support of the belief that the psychedelics are good drugs. So this is what I would like, what I wanted to share with you and um, I hope we have some time left for a discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Eric, thank you so much. That was an excellent um, <clears throat> view to the horizon of, uh, you know, what is uh, continues to be a very challenging subject. Um, um, our next session, Eric, first of all, thank you so much for an excellent presentation. We will have the presentation up on our closed LinkedIn site. Um, we will also have a recording. Uh, of of the presentation, we feel hopefully we'll be able to put it on our YouTube, our new YouTube channel. Um, a big thank you, as always, to Andre for um, you know for facilitating um, Zoom and also doing the recording and everything. Our next session is going to be a complete departure from today. It's going to be on pharmaceutical alliances, and that is going to be on the twenty fourth of uh, of March. Um, Naveed Askri, who is a professor of strategy at Fordham in New York, will be talking about what is actually behind uh, strategic alliances. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody for today's uh, uh, participation. And uh, once again, Eric, a big thank you to you. And, um, and good, have a good evening or a good afternoon or a good day. All the best to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.